William Wordsworth, um, very, very famous individual, <laughs> along with the next person we talk about, Samuel, Samuel Taylor Coolidge, probably the, two of the most uh, influential of this particular era. Um, you know, William Blake from earlier is very important as well. Um, these names that I've been telling you are people that show up on Jeopardy from time to time, um, especially if there's a romantic era or British literature type thing. It's usually a good stab in the dark if you don't know to kind of throw out one of these names. Um, very interesting individual. Um, you know, we read backgrounds of a lot of our writers because a lot of their, the things that happen in their life influence what they write about. Or there's a deeper understanding. If you recall back when we talked about Thomas Wyatt um, with Anne Boleyn and his history, and then he wrote that poem, Who So List to Hunts? You know, I will not go after her anymore, and she had the necklace around her neck for Caesar's I Am. You know, we understood that it was more than just an allusion to Caesar and his pets because we knew a little bit about him. Here is something else um, about uh, another person that we have a lot of that Im same information about, and that's William Wordsworth. Um, just reading about some of his past um, you know, upbringing and how that influences writing, and the piece that we'll read today um, is heavily influenced by his past. Um, you know, they say that he was a true literary pioneer. He defied the conventions of his time by insisting that poetry should be should express deep feelings about everyday experiences. And that's important, because if you can recall back to the introduction of this unit and the big ideas and such, you know, it was about that emotional feelings and the powerful feelings. And he was one that really was pushing, pushing and pushing for those um, to be in his writings. And that's why he stands out, and that's why he was such a, a visionary of the time. And the building background on the next page gives a little bit more insight into that same uh, premise. So that's something to remember about this era and about Wordsworth um, to help out. Um, growing up, his past, it talked about having two tragedies, the loss of his parents, which would be a tragedy for anybody, but also um, the division of his family um, after the death of his parents. Um, his brothers and himself were kept you know, closer to school, but his sister was taken away from him. And that was a big problem for him. He, whether it was a protection type thing or a bond with his sister, um, I've never lost a parent. Um, I don't know if anyone has, but I would imagine that's a big gap in your life. And you maybe bond a little bit more with your siblings. Maybe she being the only female, he has a sense of protection for. Her. And so being separated, you can imagine the struggle that one might have um, in dealing with the, with the loss. Um, and so he, uh, you know, he longed to be with her and such. And it wasn't until it said the mid 20s, so for you know half of his life, um, up to about, so he was like 12, 13, 14 when the dad died, and so mid 20s, so another decade or so um, until he could be with her again, uh, you know, regularly, and make that choice um, about how they live their life and such. Um, and so up until that point, you see that uh, you know his passion he developed for poetry, for simple country living, and for the natural world was to influence him for the rest of his life. So. Throughout his upbringing, even though he was away from his sister, at the school he developed this passion for poetry and this observation of nature and such, and we will see that played out in the piece today. Um, it's kind of interesting, just the little paragraph it has about uh, rebellion in France. Uh, remember, the very first pages of our introduction to this unit was dealing with revolutions. It had industrial revolution, but also dealt with American Revolution, French, there was one down in um, you know, the Caribbean, that type of thing, and the Napoleonic Wars. So there were all of these things going on. And, you know, out of principle, out of the ideals that he lives by and, and understands and worships to some degree, not like spiritually, but worships the, these ideas, um, he goes and, and helps. Um, you know, he falls in love with a woman, but he becomes broken, so he has to take off and go back home. And so for years it talks about there that he's feeling this sense of abandonment and loss for leaving the woman that he loved back in France that I can't stay and, and you know keep the cause going any longer because I have to run back home because I'm broke. So he has some of that guilt and some of that, um, that pressure and you can see how he teetered that last line there, he teetered on you know, a nervous breakdown and, and a collapse. Uh, so a very emotional guy, very emotional individual, um, very passionate. Um, the literary acclaim, you know, he uh, working along with his buddy Coleridge, who you don't know yet, but we'll talk about with the, the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner next. Um, you know, a very 
famous partnership, you know, work collaboration where they, um, you know, might sit around and brainstorm and come up with ideas. Um, the next piece we read is called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner for Coleridge. That was, as we'll read here and for the intro for that, you know, Wordsworth worked with him on that. It was going to be a, a dual credit. Both of them were going to get credit for it. Um, but, you know, Wordsworth had to drop out of that. But some of the ideas that he brought to the table, some of the most famous elements of the piece uh, still are in there and are still a focal point. So we still see his kind of fingerprints on that masterpiece that we'll, uh, we'll take care of in the next couple days. Um, but just a very famous individual, very, uh, you know, emotional, um, a pioneer, a visionary of that time. And so, you know, understanding all of this stuff about him will help us in our, uh, in our um, you know, undertaking the uh, Tintern Abbey here in a little bit, okay? Um, you see the literary term enjambment for Wordsworth is key. Um, that's a term you probably haven't heard of before this class. Um, it's very easy. It's more about identifying by looking, and you'll see it throughout his piece uh, today. Um, but, you know, it's when the, the punctuation gets wrapped around to another line and it doesn't end nice and crystal clear. The continuation of a sentence in a poem from one line to the next, where it kind of, you know, gra grammatically just kind of wraps around a couple lines, okay? Um, as we go through it, you'll hear um, that it's kind of different than the typical every line. It's kind of its own little thing. And so when it's read in a different way, it's, it, it might see a little jilted at times. But enjambment is something very easy to visually identify uh, once you understand, oh, well, that's enjambment. It's a piece of cake, okay? But something you haven't done before, something you haven't heard of before, uh, it might give you a, a little bit of reservation here and there, but it shouldn't, okay? Um, what I want to talk about first is uh, uh, 786, lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey. Um, on an abbey, you know, uh, um, a religious building. Um, you know, if you, uh, there's a PowerPoint on a PDF on Moodle that as, as you have some time, uh, go through it. We'll kind of go through it here in a little bit. You'll see illustrations sprinkled throughout of Tintern Abbey. A lot like um, the Canterbury Tales, where you could go and visit the Canterbury Cathedral. Um, like, you seriously could go there now. Um, Tintern Abbey still stands. Okay, it is not a practicing monastery any longer. Um, it was closed down during the time of Henry VIII. If you recall, he had that big religion issue with his, you know, with Anne Boleyn, and so he shut down monasteries and were, you know, because my Church of England is this and not Catholics and you know all of these different things. Um, but uh, you can see more information about it on a, on the PowerPoint slide. But then there are, uh, you know, several pictures that um, you can look at that are really kind of neat, um, sprinkled throughout. Now, in England, you know, a lot of times it looks kind of hazy and foggy and, you know, overcast, but we'll see a couple pretty pictures here in a little bit. You know, there's one. Uh, look at, you know, a grass type thing. There's no roof on it. But imagine what it would have been like to, you know, to walk through this um, when it was a practicing monastery and such. What was it like with that big roof on there, with the stained glass windows all still in there? I mean, we don't have much of this here in Fort Wayne. You know, there might be a couple bigger churches sprinkled throughout that are kind of still Gothic influenced, but, you know, things like this is pretty, pretty amazing. The light coming in the sides there, real nice. On the outside, it doesn't quite look as uh, grand as the inside did. Maybe it's the cows really close together. Um, but they are fenced off, so it's not like they're going to go roaming around and, you know, making a home within the, the abbey. But it's still some place that you can go in, and view um, and, and see. And I don't know, maybe people can still get married there. Maybe they can have ceremonies. I have absolutely no idea. But some place that's so historically relevant and famous, um, Wordsworth, <coughs> Tintern Abbey, very famous. And you can go and, and to the area that was the motivation for this particular piece. It's, it's kind of neat. It's a lot like if you can go to one of the Globes and watch a Shakespeare play. I mean, that's, that's time travel, guys. Um, I really like this picture here, um, you know, where they are above, uh, you know, looking down at it. Um, the title for this piece is Lines Composed a Few Miles Above T Tintern Abbey. So we could say, um, you know, line, if we wrote something, Lines Composed a Few Miles Above 
Yo-Yo. Above DuPont uh, Library. You know, something like that. Where we are in the vicinity. We are in the ballpark area. He's not saying, I'm sitting there staring at Tintern Abbey right now. But, you know, this could be, it's probably, you know, this picture is probably not miles away, but this might be someplace close. And since we know that he was very fond of nature, and he, you will see that uh, spoken several times in this piece, um, you know, this might be some sort of view. Notice the river winding through. He references cottage and the smoke coming out of their chimneys. You know, this might be a view that he had or something very similar. And so there's that, there's that moment of, wow, this, you could technically time travel to some degree here. So um, just some pictures and stuff that I think it's kind of neat to, to, uh, to look at uh, from time to time. Um, so let's go ahead and read it on uh, 786. Um, follow along with it. If the rhythm gets choppy and you start to get lost, refocus. This is only about eight minutes, so it's not a long one. But focus on what he is saying about nature from time to time. And it's, it's understandable, guys. This is probably one of the most difficult readings that we have throughout the semester. I don't think it's impossible, but you're going to you're gonna have to work a little bit. Okay? So just kind of grab onto those moments, those moments of um, nature and such. But also, as this is kind of like a monologue where he's going on, all of a sudden we find out at the end that he's not alone, that he's actually talking to somebody. And based on his history, can we guess who that might be and why this moment is interesting? Okay. Lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey. Um, hopefully you found, yeah, I know it's probably a little bit of a struggle to get through, um, you found some of those, uh, those elements of nature and we're going to go through those. Um, but who is the individual that surprisingly is he speaking with? His sister. Okay. And it's not just, oh, it's a brother-sister thing, fine. But we know about his feelings for his sister based on their absence for a decade, a decade plus. Um, and so for those last words, those last you know, couple stanzas there, hopefully that helped bring you back to, you know, the, the passion that he was talking about, the emotions that he, he feels um, about sharing this particular moment with this individual. And when he goes on to say, you know, you know, some places, if I die, think back to this time. Think back to the love that I have for you, but think back to the love I have for nature and all of these, these feelings and these memories, you know, and we will be able to, you know, be together again, kind of what, you know, in, in thought and such. Um, so, um, the beginning, if you look back on the first two pages, I'm just going to point out a couple key things. Um, you know, hopefully you understand enjambment and you can see that now. Um, you know, the wrapping from one line to the next and such. You know, how it isn't, uh, you know, there isn't some punctuation form and little phrases here and there. Um, you know, five years have passed since he's been there. Okay? Five years have passed. And it's really interesting because he, he talks a lot. I mean, just describing, you know, leaning against the tree and looking out amongst the field and looking at the orchard with the, you know, it talks about the, uh, all of the uh, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue. So looking at the apple orchard is not all red, it's just all the same, you know, shade of green here and there. And so he's just acknowledging all the different things that he notices. Okay, leaning back and looking at the smoke coming out of chimneys, coming out of the forest and out of the woods and wondering who that could be, you know, some people in the woods, some hermits in some cave, um, just enjoying this situation, this scenery. I don't know if any of you have ever gone on a vacation to some place where it's just visually beautiful and you just, maybe mountains, maybe a lake, you know, just something that's just very calming, okay, very calming. And he almost has kind of a, um, a, a teleportation back to some degree of when he was a child. Okay, he goes into great details about when I bound through around the river like a, like a row, like a deer, and I would play. And when I was little, I was having a great time, but when you're a kid playing outside, do you really appreciate how beautiful it is and everything? Or are you just like, play, 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 run, run, run? Okay, and so he talks about how all of these memories come back to him about how he enjoyed nature, how he, you know, as a kid really embraced it. But... 
he was too young to really understand nature. Now, being older, being wiser, I can appreciate this a little bit more for what it was. Okay? <coughs> and I love nature now, and I love nature then, but they're a little bit different. Um, he says that the memory of the woods and cottages offered tranquil restoration to his mind and even affected him when he was not aware of the memory. So while he was away, thinking back to this, it helped calm him, it helped restore him. It, he mentioned that when I was off in a city, whether I was alone or far away or with some people, you know, I would think back to this place. I would think back to this, this setting, this, these visuals that now I am seeing again. And it brought me a lot of peace. It brought me a lot of comfort. Okay. Do you remember a certain trip that you took at some point in your life, maybe five to ten years ago, and you distinctly remember a visual image? Have you ever gone back to that same place and like, oh yeah, this is the place. One of my earliest memories was I was like two or three, and I went to Disneyland out in California. I remembered nothing throughout my life except I remember look, you know, right in the entrance, usually there's a big train that goes across, and you have to walk underneath it, you know, well, not like under a train, but like a tunnel. Um, but I distinctly remember a train co well, coming to me this way, coming across this way. And I just remember that. I don't remember sights and I, I'm, uh, sounds and smells, but I remember visually what it looked like. Um, and so I took some journalism students to a convention there four or five years ago. And I remember standing there in the front of Disneyland in California and watched a train go across. And I was like, this is the same spot I stood when I was three. You know, and so it was kind of a nice little, wow, think about how I've changed in my life. Think about how I've grown up, things that I've experienced. You know, stresses and things, and you can think back to this, this for me. I didn't look back to Disneyland and think, hey, that was awesome. But you look back at certain things in life, and that brings you some calm. Those of you looking forward to spring break or summer, are you going to some place you've gone to before? You probably know what to, what to expect, what that's going to be like. Soaking in the sun, going skiing, whatever. And so you have that to look forward to, and that gives you some calm. And then when you go there, it's enjoyable. Um, I like line 61, right around in there. It says that the pictures of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in the moment, in this moment, there is life and food for future years. And so you go back to experience that memory, and you're there, and maybe it's identical to what you thought, maybe it's a little different, but it's almost like you're now you're hitting the record button. Not only are you standing here enjoying what's happening, but you're recording all of this. So that, wow, I'm enjoying this so much right now. But also, you're recording this so that in the future you can go someplace and hit play, and you have this newer, fresher appreciation for this particular place. And it's all steeped, you know, in nature and such. Okay? He mentions the river, you know, meandering through the, the trees and through the forest. And that's why looking at that picture before we started, you know, that river is the same river that he was looking upon and quoting and talking about here. And that's why to go to that place and visually see that nature and that appreciation. Maybe you could hunt down. I don't know if that orchard is still there. But wouldn't it be kind of cool if through the little, you know, the little hints here, an orchard, there's some cottages with smoke the near the river, and if you could pinpoint maybe a couple acres where you think it, it might be, that might be kind of neat. I wonder if somebody's ever done that. Um, but we see these elements of nature. We see, remember we talked about in the uh, introduction, the child and the common man, the innocence of children and such. This isn't a story about or a poem about children, but yet through his childhood memories, we are able to make that connection to those passion, emotion, feelings about nature and, and his sister and such. And so we get to see little elements sprinkled in uh, for motivations. Um, you know, just lines sprinkled throughout. You know, therefore, am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and the mountains? So he just he keeps going on. And I think that if you were to read this through a second time, these things would pop out a little bit more, and you might be able to keep your, your focus a little bit. But really, being eight minutes, it shouldn't have been too difficult. But yet, maybe the enjambment, 
maybe the, the rhythm of it messed you up a little, maybe some of the footnotes, you know, um, that's why a second exposure is always, is always beneficial. Um, yeah, we don't know that there is anybody with him, okay, anybody with him until uh, he says, my dear, dear sister, there at the bottom of 790 and such. Um, Um, let me see here. You know, even if he did not feel this way about the nature or understand all the things, he would still be in good spirits for this day. I would still be happy for what's going on today. Even if I didn't have those previous four pages, you know, the previous hundred lines of thoughts about nature. Because why? Because I am with you, dear sister. And then I'm like, oh, okay, sister, connection. Oh, well, he really is an emotional individual at this particular time. And think about all of that record button that he was going to be hitting. It wasn't, now we know it's not just because he wants to record all the beautiful panoramics around. It's recording my time with my sister as well. Okay? And so to see that they can appreciate that. Um, you know, a few lines in here. Nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Nature's power over the mind that seeks her out is such that it renders that mind imper impervious to evil tongues, rash judgments, and the sneers of selfish men, and instilling instead a cheerful faith that the world is full of blessings. And so this nature, you know, he even asks nature, the wind, blow upon my sister, the moon shine down on her, let her see this nature, and let her appreciate nature, and nature will take care of her, and, you know, she will have these moments to think of as well. And then, like I said, when we first started this particular piece, um, talking about it, um, <clears throat> you know, that memory, if I am dead, if I am gone, think back to this time, sister. If you can't hear my voice any longer, just remember what my feelings are for you, but what my feelings are for this place and nature and everything else around here so that you can come back here and, and really my voice and my spirit will continue because you will be experiencing all of these things and thinking in the same mind frame that I was thinking, okay? Now, that's a lot for me to expect you to get out of this because this is one, I'd probably say, the top three or four most difficult pieces. <laughs> Not that it's crazy hard, but it's just, it's a lot more difficult than reading those poems.